Hi, this is Paul from Grant Thornton. So welcome to our webinar. We're just going to wait a few a minute while all of the participants uh, join the webinar. We're just going to give this one minute as more participants are are, are joining the webinar. <clears throat> Okay, Jess, Jesse, will I want to kick off? Yeah, go for it. Okay, I'm Paul Jacobs, uh, the head of Forensic and Investigation Services Unit at Grant Thornton, and you're all very welcome to this lunchtime a webinar. The webinar is entitled How to Define and Respond to Fraud Risk During COVID-19. But before I hand over to our speakers, I'd like to share some opening remarks. As you know, fraud is consistently ranked by boards of directors as one of the top five risks. When COVID hit, as you'll also know, this meant that organizations increasingly had to work both digitally and remotely. Some organizations were better prepared than others. In our opinion, we have a cocktail of factors occurring concurrently, giving rise to increased fraud risk to organizations. This top cocktail includes the following factors. Some organizations resorted to quick fixes to use untested platforms and procedures in an effort to pivot their business online. Fraudsters are exploiting opportunities in, for example, various online scams. Remote working has worked very well and thank goodness for the internet and the cloud. However, I would argue that in a purely rem remote working environment, some of the red flags that organizations would historically look out for and pick up are now less visible. Coupled with that, during the COVID pandemic, some industries have found that their labor market has been quite fluid and there has been mobility of employees between employers. New hirings have been made without traditional face-to-face -face interviews. Organizations are finding that their control systems are being stretched in a number of cases. As we all know, there's significant uncertainty, and I believe that staff are working under high pressure. Another factor in, in this cocktail is the recessionary economic conditions, with many businesses forced to close. Most of these hopefully, hopefully will be temporary in nature, but inevitably and unfortunately, this will be permanent for other businesses. Either way, many businesses are under financial pressure at present. But having been around the block a few times in my life, in my experience, recessions, recessions tend to mean increased fraud, both in terms of previously undetected fraud coming to light, but importantly, in the case of the COVID-19, I would highlight the impact of pressure on individuals and organizations. The Garda National Economic Crime Bureau has reported that cryptocurrency frauds and other online investment scams have increased massively since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. In recent months and, and our team, we have investigated a case whereby a website was cloned, investors groomed to make investments, and those monies were lost. In reality, those funds were quickly misappropriated by the fraudster and routed to offshore bank accounts. This use of the unregulated financial sector was a key risk identified by the Financial Actions Task Force report on COVID-19. Some of the other risks that they identified in relation to money laundering and terrorist financing were criminals finding ways to bypass customer due diligence measures, and I think that that's, that's a key one. Increased misuse of online financial services and virtual assets to move and conceal illicit funds. So for a good example of that would be cryptocurrencies. 
and ex exploiting economic stimulus measures. And our speakers will speak a bit about that during this presentation. We at Grant Thornton continue to see email and SMS phishing attacks, business email compromise scams, and ransomware attacks. Indeed, FATF has reported a sharp rise in social engineering attacks. And as we all know, these attacks use links to fraudulent websites or malicious attachments to obtain personal payment information. Importantly, we at Grant Thornton and in these opening remarks would like to provide insight into what risks are likely to play out in 2021. So let's just focus on a few. If I was to take the effect on individuals who have lost jobs or whose owner-managed businesses are struggling, when it comes to finances, there is a risk of, of fraud being perpetrated. Previous recessions have shown us that when people's back is against the wall, some of them do stupid things and conduct fraud. As we approach the year end, 31 December, this will be the, the accounting year end for many companies. Let's consider financial statement fraud. There has to be a risk of massaging results to look better than they were actually were during 2020. At an operational level, a prolonged economic downturn could mean that organizations' resources to combat fraud will be stretched as they become preoccupied business continuity issues. Tax evasion may increase as individuals and companies face economic difficulties and look to reduce their tax burden. And then there are likely to be issues surrounding employees. If I was to take um, some disgruntled employees who have been forced to let go to clear short notice, the risk of theft of intellectual property is certainly an issue. And I would bear in mind that many of these employees are currently working exclusively remotely, which, often which may often mean there's less scrutiny applied. And we in Grant Thornton have already seen evidence of employees leaving employment to set up competing businesses. And again, and appropriately taking intellectual property, whether it be customer lists, um, other contact information, know-how, et cetera. We saw it in the last recession and we're starting to see it already in the current COVID environment. Fraud is not victimless. It impacts organizations' revenues, profitability, and in some cases, even their sustainability. It is a serious risk that needs to be managed day in and day out. And during this COVID-19 period, we need to be extra vigilant and take appropriate steps to safeguard our assets, our intellectual property, and all aspects of our organization. I'd now like to introduce you to our speakers, Sinead O'Neill and Rosalind Lee Simmons, both directors in our Forensic and Investigation Services team. Sinead and Ros have extensive forensic experience. Sinead combines her insolvency background with fraud investigations and expert witness assignments in Northern Ireland and also the Republic of Ireland. Roz is a data analytics specialist with extensive experience in accounting and professional standards, fraud investigations, and is also a testifying expert. I'd now like to hand the baton on to Sinead, please. That's great. Thanks, Paul. You're all very welcome. Um, and thanks for joining us today at this lunchtime. So today what we're going to talk about in the next 40, which is up to 45 minutes, is we have, we're going to talk about the COVID-19 and the fraud risks that that environment has created. We're going to specifically talk about external and internal risks, and then we're going to hopefully give you some tools and army with, with some um, principles that will help protect you and reduce these fraud risks to an acceptable level for your particular organisation. There is a Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen, of most of your screens, if not, it'll be at the top. Feel free to ask questions throughout, throughout the presentation and we'll, come, we'll leave some time at the end to address that. So if we just kind of kick things off, I think with our first poll question, I think it'd be interesting to gauge um, the extent that people have been falling victim to fraud since the pandemic started. So if you could all answer whether you have had an internal or external fraud committed on your organization since COVID-19. So yes, no, or not sure. 
and bear in mind the, the, these answers are anonymous um, so we won't be able to see who's, who's hit what so please answer honestly. I'll just give that a few more minutes and we will kind of get the results and we'll have a quick chat about them. Okay, great. Can we see the results please, Jesse? That's great. Okay, this is quite promising. Um, we see that 9% of respondents actually said they have fallen victim to fraud since COVID-19 started, so back March time. The majority of people on today's webinar actually haven't fallen victim to, and that, I find that quite quite reassuring. Um, but also, I'll, my, in my sceptical mindset, it's almost a case of not yet, um, and I'll explain that in a bit more detail in the next few slides. And then we have a not sure at this time, which is, which is just right of evidence response. I mean, one of the studies that was conducted by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners actually said that for an internal, you know, to identify an internal fraud, it actually took up to 14 months. Um, so you can see that there's a bit of lead time in that. So whilst these fraudulent acts might be committed during the pandemic, the, when it actually rises to the surface, surface within organizations can be quite a different time period altogether. So thank you very much for that. And just Bert, taking the point of majority of people on this call haven't fallen victim to it. Obviously in our line of work, myself and uh, Paul and Roz, it is a case unfortunately of not if, but maybe when. Um, and we've seen that plenty of times. We can see that in the next slide with all the tabloids um, in recent months. And these are just a few tabloids. Jesse, can we just flick up the next? Great, thank you. Um, these are just a few of the headlines that we've grabbed and it really didn't take us long to do at all, both north and south of the border. Many of them are very much scams and fraud, and fraud schemes that have been operating specifically to do with COVID-19 or have evolved due to the COVID-19. Um, some of them you'll, you'll recognise, some of them you might not. Um, I'll not touch on any particular one because they are out there. Um, but certainly in our line of work, we have been involved in, very, in reacting to similar schemes of this nature. And as you can see, it's not necessarily unique to one sector or one size of organisation. So that's when I say necessarily it's not a case of if, but when. I don't mean to scare you, but it is something to be mindful of. And um, just because you haven't fallen victim yet does not mean that you are immune. And we'll hopefully arm you with some tools today to help to help increase that. So if we just move on to a case of particularly why does COVID-19 increase create and increase fraud risk? Well, as Paul alluded to, COVID-19, we're, we're, we're working in a very unique environment. It is somewhat unprecedented and it is a field day for fraud. So some of the main factors, which I'm sure some of you can, can, can understand and relate to, is that many of the fraud controls are diminished as organisations limit operations to essential personnel. Maybe many staff had to be furloughed or let go, and they've had to reduce their core operations to very small numbers. This might necessarily mean that people are doing duties that they wouldn't have necessarily done. They're spreading themselves too thin. That segregate, segregation of duties controls just might not be there. It's simple things like getting two signatures on a check. That's not necessarily possible anymore. Um, so they've had to reduce it to one, which further increases the risk. The IT department's focus has shifted from you know, protecting the organization against external fraud threats, making sure that the antivirus system is up and running and working and regular checks um, being carried out. But now their shift is focused to more hard work, making sure their employees are up and running, working from home. So their time has been spread thin too. So that's, that's some of the few reasons why the fraud controls have actually diminished um, over the last number of months. And it is only natural when businesses just want to keep things going, keep the lights on and maintain um, their customer service um, and co compete effectively. The second thing to touch on customer service is consumer be behavior has changed. Many people have moved away from kind of shopping in shops where, where, where and when it is actually possible to do so and more online based transactions. So that kind of gives scammers and fraudsters a bit more of a global reach um, in terms of infiltrating kind of dummy websites or extracting personal information, credit card information, and alluring people into certain websites and certain and certain devices that capture this information for identity theft or monetary gain. So customers are moving to a shift online, um, which has increased the risk um, as well, more than we've probably seen in past pandemics or past economic situations. And the last one, millionaires are stuck at home with COVID-19 worries and arguably more susceptible to scams. So this pandemic is quite unique in that it's not an economic necessity necessarily just an economic one. People have a lot of other things going on in terms of health and vulnerable people around them. 
that might make their, their focus shift slightly, a bit more susceptible and vulnerable to these scams when they're just trying to react um, and, they're, and you know react and keep their family and friends safe whilst maintaining um, you know, the income into the household. And we'll talk a bit more about that in the, in the next few slides. So he's gone great. So the COVID-19 fraud challenge. So there's two ways that this kind of fraud has increased. It has developed in new fraud related fraud scams, which we'll talk about in due course. And browsers have actually adapted existing fraud scams, which have been enabled by COVID-19. Many of what we're particularly seeing isn't new in principle. They've just adapted it to make it relevant just for the circumstances and the terminologies that's out there for the COVID-19 um, particular environment. So on that basis, I'd like to understand if anybody on the call, now this is probably geared to ones who actually have fallen victim to fraud in the last number of months, but has your organisation, this is poll question two, so has your organisation experienced an increase in fraud in, due to COVID-19? So yes, no, or not sure at this time. So that'll just flick up on your screen in a couple of seconds and we'll just get a few results. I think this would be interesting to see if people on the call had actually, you know, if what we're seeing, particularly as professionals investigating these frauds, if that's been seen in, in local organisations, um, and whether whether that's concurrent with the global the global survey results, which we're, which I'll talk about in due course. Okay, great, Jesse. Can we get the results, please? Perfect. Okay, so we can see that out of the people um, that, that responded to this one, we have seen a slight increase. Um, in organisations that, ha that have seen an increase in the fraud due to the COVID-19 and some that have not. And again, I caveat that with not yet. Um, but it is interesting in that the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners did a global, um, a global sort of impact study, study in relation to COVID. And of, of that, 77% of their respondents actually did report an increase um, in scams during the COVID-19 period. And they actually think that over the next 12 months, there'll be 90, 92% of those respondents believe that's only ever going to increase. And that's shown by some of the stats that Paul spoke about this morning, um, with the Garda um, have actually identified that up until September, there was 3 million um, you know, damage to victims in relation to, since the start of COVID in relation to fraud. That's going to, they estimate it's going to increase to 4.5 by the end of the year. So that coupled with the global survey and a few other um, kind of local research projects we've seen, it is inevitable that that risk will increase. Um, so it is important to protect your organisation as much as possible in the coming weeks, months and years to come um, as Frozer's job is to evolve. Um, it's their full-time job to evolve and react to the current circumstances. So you need to give your organisations um, the best shot you can at preparing yourself um, to fall victim to, some, to one of their scams. So we just move on and we'll start talking about the specific scams and questions. So we'll talk about external versus internal fraud. So just the next slide, please, Jesse. Great, thank you. So external fraud and internal fraud, they pretty much do what they say on the tin. External fraud covers a broad range of schemes depending on the business who's being targeted. It occurs when an external party, such as a vendor, a customer, or a third party commits fraud against an organization. So essentially from the outside in, something that's not in the in-house of your organization. Um, and it's not necessarily, well, arguably more as controllable as what possibly internal fraud is. And Rose will talk about that in, in the next um, number of minutes. An internal fraud, also called occupational fraud, this occurs when an employee, manager, or an executive commits fraud against his or her employer, usually falls into three main categories, financial statement fraud, asset misappropriation, and corruption. And that's attacks coming from the inside. Someone that knows your systems and knows how the way you operate, knows your strengths, your weaknesses, and how to infiltrate that and exploit vulnerabilities within your network. So if we just, I'm gonna take you through some of the schemes that we've identified as being very specific to the COVID-19 environment and very much focus on the external threats. So I touched on this briefly before, but this is more in the context of external fraud. How does COVID-19 increase the risk of external fraud? So as we touched on, people are in a heightened state of anxiety. It does make people more vulnerable. They're maybe out of sorts. They're, they're not necessarily maintaining their, their, the behavior that they probably would have once have had. And they're very reactive in terms of if a payment isn't being made or you know if their card appears to be declined or they think that there's a new vaccine that they can avail of. These prey on the vulnerabilities and the emotional intelligence um, 
of the people, um, of the victims. And for others prey on this, that's that's their job to do so. They they don't know um they they don't have any any reservations about exploiting um front vulnerabilities on um, and victims. A second thing is chaotic work environments do make it easier to commit fraud as oversight might be more lax. This goes back to the segregation of duties. The controls are, are a bit weakened. People are more they're more focused on getting the job done necessarily than, you know, going through the five steps of, you know, chains of commands that maybe necessarily were there, or as I say, segregation of duties that maybe isn't possible um, in the current climate. Next thing is remote working. So many of us on this webinar today are probably um, largely based um, from home and very much rely um, on the IT infrastructure that's in place within our household. Now that does create data protection vulnerabilities and it does mean that your infrastructure at home is, is more, more likely than not less protected than businesses. People are using their home Wi-Fi, which could easily um, be exploited, They're using, potentially using personal devices which doesn't have the necessarily level, same level of protection of what they would have if they were using office-based devices. And they're also not necessarily um, on the same IT network as what they would be in the office. And the last one there is dark web activity. There's a number, um, the, 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 for, sorry, apologies, for those who don't know what dark web activity is, um, this is a, a hidden place of the internet where fraudsters, criminals go to discuss and share information with regards to committing criminal acts. Um, it's a place that not many of us want to find ourselves or do rarely. Um, it's somewhere to, to stay clear of. But it does show you that the COVID-19 um, fraud scams are actually actively being discussed on the dark web. So I, I'll prove that just by um, the next slide where there's a screenshot um, of, a, of, a, of a thread on this particular forum. Um, and this is where a number of fraudsters are sharing ways of taking advantage of the pandemic. So you'll see there that someone said, maybe try a funding campaign. And this is where fraudsters, they, they use things that have been trialed and tested and different across the world. There's absolutely, you know, they're not operating within their jurisdictions or the relevant country borders. They are sharing things that have worked. They're asking um, for information if anybody has anything to hand, some quick wins, something that they can just email out, you know, send an email out to a number of people that they've stolen their identities from or stolen their, their email addresses. Uh, but you can see there that this level of sharing of data can be quite dangerous um, and it's something that current, the fraudsters are, are actively en engaged in. And they're keeping up to date as well. If somebody finds a new way of working, um, they are using using this to, to keep up to date um, and maintain the efficiency of, of their, their fraudulent acts, which is quite, um, it can be quite scary, uh, but it just shows you the level of reach and who we're actually dealing with um, as, as criminals. So here's a few examples of the external fraud um, that we've been able to, to, to see. So brand jacking or imposter scams. So this is where a fraudster uses your name, logo and or brand to reach your customers or employees to solicit information or other disingenuous means. Think of a phone call to your customers asking them to update their contact information or a malicious app, which we'll discuss in due course. Um, it, it, it's easy to do, you know, I think it, it's nowadays, I think we've all fallen victim to receiving a, an email or junk from Amazon, purporting to be from Amazon um, or a larger organization or Apple, an invoice from Apple that might not necessarily be genuine, but almost prompts a response from you in the hope that they would, you know, extract that information um, and use it to, to by fraudulent means. Malware. So malware is a big thing, as Paul alluded to. Um, it's software used to damage devices, steal data or gain unauthorized access. For example, particularly under COVID situation where governments and, and public, public sector organizations are luring people to up, get, provide their details um, in relation to COVID, like the, the number of track and trace apps that we have across all the, across the world and, and north and south of the border. But fraudsters know that these exist and they're luring employees and customers to a COVID-19 related website or application, which then downloads malware onto the work device. And once that malware is on the work device, there's no there's no stopping the damage it can do. It can it can keep it can copy the key um, information in, and it can start to extract company information, IP, and also any financial information that sits on the systems. So, film business email compromise. A fraud. This is where a fraudster sends a bogus email to the victim, masking as a known party with fraudulent payment instructions. And with everybody working from home and this time of crisis, requests can seem very real, and controls may not be closely followed. This is one particular one that isn't necessarily new, as, as most of these that we're discussing in principle. It's just been tailored um, for, for COVID. 
So this would have been one that we would have seen maybe a few years ago um, in relation to um, a solicitor solicitor accounts when a transaction was due to close on a Friday evening. You know, the fraudsters were already on the network of the solicitor firm, knowing that a transaction was going to complete, knowing when it was due to complete and the deadlines. And just before that deadline or, you know, was about to complete, they would send an email to the buyer and say, oh, apologies, payment details have changed. Please deposit X amount of monies into this. Apologies for the inconvenience. And with time pressures, with everybody wanting the deal to close before the banks did, the money was transferred to the fraudsters' account, and before before you know it, the money was was making its way around the world. So this is a very real, um, a very real risk. It's something that, particularly in the, in the legal industry, they've become more aware of it over time and put the necessary um, controls in place to do so. But it's not unique to legal in, legal industry, and um, fraudsters can can create these bogus emails quite easily. So social engineering. So similar to business email compromise. Fraudsters prey on this, um, given the uncertain time. They leverage social engineering to persuade victims to transfer funds or divulge sensitive information. It can be used for identity theft, account takeover, or to, or actually to just gain money in, in a number of other ways. So we'll just go through a few phishing examples just on the next slide, please, Jesse. Or number of social engineering you should be on the lookout for. So Paul had mentioned phishing. Um, this is very, very common. And as I said, it's not new, it's not a new phenomenon at all. Um, it's fraudulent communication that purports to be from a legitimate sender to induce the victim to reveal financial or email credentials. Now, particularly in Grant Thornton, we we'd carry out regular phishing exercises on our you know on our staff and see who clicks on on suspicious links um, or see who's prompted um, to go down that route. And it is something so simple, but again, it's it, it's a low value for the fraudster, but it's a mass um, it's a mass effort. Um, if that makes sense. So um, it's been a word, it's teaching your employees um, to be very mindful of what they're clicking on, what they're receiving in to their emails, to their letters, to their text messages, um, because phishing is essentially um, a very real phenomenon and it's something so easy that can be done and preys on people's vulnerability and induces them to reveal a sensitive data. So smishing is very similar. It uses SMS text messages, you know, particularly the government um, and public sector organisations are focusing now on SMS text messages, HMRC, you know, the revenue and the government, you know, to, to update your data. So that's another one that's probably emerged a bit more through COVID, um, asking you, you know, to link into a website and input your details. Um, spoofing occurs when communication from an unknown source, often a criminal, is disguised as a known legitimate source. And deep fake. This is quite an emerging um, scheme in which browsers are using deep fake audio or video to impersonate a trusted party to trick a victim into sending money to an account owned by the fraudster. Now, this is a phenomenon that actually was around a number of years ago, but very much focused on the TV and film industry. It was used in animation, it was used in films. Um, but now, over the last number of years, that equipment that was being used to do that has now become um, quite economical to buy and you can almost hear from the, from the, the comfort of your own bedroom as fraudsters are doing um, and I haven't don't, I don't have a video to show you today but there's numerous ones out there that you can get deep fake videos where it looks like Obama Trump and a number of other influential people around the world are saying things that aren't actually them and it's quite convincingly and um, so this is a, this is one of the schemes to look out for in the next couple of years and something to be mindful of and can be quite difficult to spot admittedly so if we just move on, that'd be great. So why are they why are they all time high? What are the type of specific COVID nineteen phishing schemes that are out there? So ones that we have seen in you know from from our customers and clients and indeed ourselves that have came into our particular inbox is you know for emails that are coming from for you know asking you to verify your personal information or to receive funding. So that's preying on people's vulnerabilities. You know that they want the cash in. ASAP. So, you know, have I not filled in a form properly? Okay, yeah, send me the link, I'll do it ASAP. You know, very reactive um, because the priority is, is to get cash into the business and fraudsters know that. Charitable contributions, we all know it's all unfortunately widely publicized heart curve, you know, detrimental effect this, this pandemic has had on charities. And there is a conscious effort amongst charities to increase donations. Um, and fraudsters are preying on this and they're preying on, on people's kind of charitable nature during this difficult time general financial relief from banks, governments and, and other sources, airline carrier refunds, you know, many of us had, had holidays booked over the summer, seems like a long time ago now, but it would have 
be unusual for any of us to see something um, that looked to be from one of our airlines talking about a refund that we may or may not have started. Um, but the chances are that somebody will have received that and has is in the process of 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 kind of requesting a refund. And the and the fraudsters do rely on this in the hope that they send ten emails and one of them sticks. Um, and it lures people in to, to provide that information on a potentially fraudulent website. Fake cures and vaccines, we've seen a lot about this in recent days with the vaccines, um, but it is, again, preying on the emotional side and the vulnerability side of people prompting them to be first in line for a cure and vaccine. Give us your details and, you know, or provide us with £10, and, you know, we'll make sure that the vaccine gets posted out to you ASAP. Um, and, you know, the, as you can see, you can see people's kind of natural reaction is, well, you know, I want to do what's right for me and my family, so I'll do that. Um, and the fake testing kits, kits very similar. Um, and again, fraudsters are aware of all of these schemes um, and they're trying they're trying to push people's buttons into, into providing as much information as possible and preying on the vulnerability that currently exists in, in, in recent times. So this is just another example of the dark web and the phishing website that goes on. Um, and I think it's, a, it, it's quite interesting because they're, act, they're actively discussing, does anybody have any, you know, phishing lures? Some of them are sharing templates back and forth. And one of them in particular says, why don't you suggest, um, you know, running a funding or a coronavirus resource webinar and extract information that way? And I can assure you this is not one of these, <laughs> um, but it just goes you to show that they're, they're bouncing ideas off each other. Some of them are even providing templates for, for for the fraudster to just lift and put into their to their email system and send to the to the mass amount of emails that they have um, stolen, and it's just okay. It's as easy as that. And as I say, look, it's 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 hoping that one sticks. They don't have to. It doesn't take that much um, to send an email these days. So it, again, it just heightens the fact that this is an active industry for people. This is a you know this is a very a very profitable interest industry for fraudsters, and it is many people's full time jobs, which is quite worrying. So if we just go on, I'll just show you one of the fit examples of a phishing email. That's probably one of the first ones that have kind of started to circulate back in March, April time. Um, and this was purported to be from the World Health Organization. So as you see there, they're prompting people to go through and to look at the safety measures that have been issued by the World Health Organization. And, you know, there was rarely a day or at least a week that went by where we weren't seeing a World Health Organization um, being refer referenced in the news or a conference. Um, or a press conference. So it, if I received this in, it, you know, the alarm bells wouldn't necessarily start ringing um, because it's topical, it's there. I mean, I would query as to how they got my details, um, but some people might not necessarily have been, you know, thought that bit through. It wouldn't be on unreasonable for those to want to protect themselves as much as possible and therefore be prompted and successfully click on the safety measures. And in that, that would lead they would have to put in their personal details, which would lead the fraudster to be able to steal their identity. Um, and at this stage, this particular one was just all about identity theft. There was no financial gain, um, but it could easily have been a financial gain and taken a bit of a step for, further. Um, but again, like it just goes to show that they're adapting to the current world that we live in. So if we just go on to finalize with another few external fraud examples that we've came across, the synthetic identity. This is where fraudster compounds real, typically stolen, potentially from like um, from a source like the email previously, and fake information to create a new identity and opens and applies for stimulus benefits, which we know was you know both north and south of the border. There's a new number of stimulus packages out there, and I'll touch on them um, in the, just in the next few slides specifically. Loan fraud. So a fraudster applies for a relief loan that they're not actually entitled to. This can be done by forging documents, misrepresentation information, or by bribing an official. And then benefit fraud, similar to loan fraud, if this is where a fraudster actually applies for the relief benefits that they're not necessarily entitled to. This can be done by forging documents, again, representing information, or also, again, by bribing an official to commit a fraudulent act. And the last one there is a fraudster uses techniques to woo an elderly individual in order to fraudulently obtain access to their relief benefits. It can actually be perpetrated by a family member, caretaker, or in fact a stranger, whether that be called to the door or online. And this is something that, again, isn't a new principle, but it's something to be aware of, particularly in these, you know, we do have to protect the vulnerable. Um, and it is important that, that, that things that we might necessarily pick out as not necessarily being a risk might not be the same when it comes to the elderly generation who isn't, you know, particularly at okay with with emails back and forth. Um, 
as a, as a method of communication. So if we just go on to the next slide, Jesse. So I thought it'd be interesting to actually focus on the government stimulus and why that actually we believe creates broad risks. Some of the articles um, on, on the first few slides that I put up do relate to fraudulent claiming um, of loans. And we're seeing in recent times that, that that is likely only to increase as government's focus shifts on to, rather than getting the funds out, which would have been the case for the last number of months, but were, have they actually gone into the right hands? And that admittedly hasn't actually been the focus um, of government departments. It, it was more of a case of reacting to the pandemic and reacting and helping businesses, local businesses to survive. But now we're starting to see, we're starting to see investigations been carried out. We're starting to see the checks been retrospectively been put in place and people are starting to be investigated and penalised for that. Um, so I would, we would anticipate over the next couple of months and years um, that that the government departments start to look back on actually did we, you know, did we give that, you know, was was that funding actually made correctly? And what what controls do we have and what documents do we have on file that that, that helps us prove that? So example of those fraud schemes in relation to government stimulus packages is that a fraud proposes as a small business owner to secure a loan. And they can do this by all those um, mechanisms I just spoke about. They can start to build your, you know, steal, steal your business identity. They can build up a, a, a fake identity by using real details to secure a loan and they might be successful in that. A scammer impersonates an agency offering a loan or benefit through a series of social engineering schemes. And this is with the intent of actually obtaining the beneficiary bank account information of the person applying for the loan and therefore, you know, being able to do the damage in, in through that way. And then the last one there is that a fraud actor actually poses as a consultant who actually that offers stimulus support programs. They actually falsely collect the fees to assist in this program, as well as identifying information from individuals and businesses. So they're gathering information that they then use um, for other criminal activity. So if I just kind of talk briefly um, and I'll finish up on this and then a call, a final poll question is other schemes that we've come across. So as I said for charity and crowdfunded scams, so we've, we've seen this, we've seen that there's out of pressure and charities, but the fraudsters are actually setting up fake charity websites and soliciting donations for non-existent or illegitimate, illegitimate charitable organisations. Paul spoke about investment fraud. People, you know, are, are actually do which is quite a, it's quite a nuance uh, and different to, to the last recession in that people actually do have money, there's their savings there um, and the fraudsters know that. So they're, they're, they're kind of pushing people into to making money schemes, insider trading, pump and dump schemes, cryptocurrency scams. Again, as, as more transactions are committed online, as we said, there's the increased risk of seller and buyer scams, people buying and selling things that don't necessarily exist and leaving victims out of pocket, healthcare and provider scams, medical providers obtaining patient information for COVID-19 testing, and then using that information to fraudulently bill for other tests or procedures and fraudsters preying on this. App scams, this is a big one, as, as we all know that, you know that the government devices to download track and trace programs and apps. Um, as I say, you know, scammers and fraudsters are aware of this. They're creating and manipulating mobile apps. They're creating dummy apps, ones that look very much like the copycat um, government, government approved ones. And they insert malware that compromise users' devices and gain that information through through that means. And that's one of money mules. Fraud actors may exploit unemployed populations as money mules. They might create fake work from home job scams or, or often posing as processors for COVID-19 charity donations. So it is prey, as you can see there in what I've just spoke about, fraudsters are adapting to the way to the way the, the world is now. Um, and, and they're not afraid to keep doing so over the next weeks and months. So I just finish up with one last um, poll question. So in terms of a plan um, for those of you, either even if you have or haven't experienced fraud as of yet during COVID-19, does your organisation have an established plan to deal with COVID-19 related fraud? So yes, we have an established plan or executing against plan. B, we're in a process of establishing a plan and then just there we have no established plan. Just give you a few seconds. Um, you know, and you, you, you would be quick to, you know, to forgive anybody who maybe necessarily doesn't have a plan in place. Um, when, when when times are hard and people's focus are shifting to keeping the lights on and business operations running, um, and it might not necessarily be a written down plan, it might be something that's in the process. And hopefully by today, um, you'll leave with some, some useful tools to help implement in your organisation. Okay, 
perfect. Okay, so we can see there that some people do have an established plan, which is very promising, and the other, so, almost an equal amount are actually in the process of establishing a plan. And the majority of people in the webinar actually have no established plan in place. And as I say, look, that is not surprising, but it is something that hopefully we leave today. And whilst we've identified some external fraud risks and internal fraud risks, that you actually then leave with ways to reduce that risk and hopefully some food for thought in, in, that, in, in that arena. So I'll just hand you over to Ross to talk more specifically about the internal fraud risks that COVID has created in the current, current climate. Thank you, Sinead, and thank you, Paul. Um, as Sinead touched off, I am going to look at internal fraud. So what is internal fraud? As Sinead mentioned earlier, it uh, occurs when an employee, manager or executive commits fraud against his or her employer. Internal fraud, as we mentioned earlier, falls into three categories. Those three categories are financial statement fraud, asset misappropriation and corruption. So just to give a high level understanding as to what we mean by each of these, financial statement fraud is the deliberate misrepresentation of the financial condition of a company through the intentional misstatement or omission of amounts or disclosures in the financial statements. And this is to deceive financial statement users. For example, in the COVID environment, I know Paul mentioned earlier, you could misstate your revenue. You could increase your, your bottom line, your profits, or you indeed you could reduce your profits, basically uh, to, dependent on what you were trying to do for your end users. Asset misappropriation, fraud can be broken down into three major categories for mis uh, asset misappropriation. They are cash receipt schemes, so that could be skimming, so taking money before it enters the accounting system. So somebody working in a shop is taking the money before it actually hits the system. Um, taking money after it hits the accounting system. So money comes in to the front desk and somebody takes that out. So it's to pay a bill, okay? And somebody takes that money before it actually gets in there. And then finally, fraudulent disimbursement. So this is false refunds. So you've got someone who maybe works in a retail um, environment they ring up the sale of a product. They don't give the end user their receipt. The end they ask the end user, would you like the receipt? No, thank you. I've got enough paper in my, in my wallet. They then take that receipt and they do a false refund up for themselves. Okay. Um, and then finally, the theft of inventory and of uh, non-cash assets, uh, assets even. Corruption is the term used to describe various types of wrongful acts designed to cause an unfair advantage. And it can take many forms. Those forms include bribery, kickbacks, illegal gratuities, economic extortion, and collusion. When we consider fraud in this COVID environment we find ourselves in, we must keep these three types of fraud to the forefront of our minds. In addition, when we consider internal fraud during COVID, our starting point will always be Cressy's fraud triangle. As everyone knows, there are three elements, key elements to Cressy's fraud triangle. They are pressure, opportunity, and rationalization. So is the employee under pressure? Do they fear unemployment for themselves or family members and the ensuing economic hardship that's going to follow? Can the employee rationalize the committing of a fraud? This is the only way I can actually support my family in this environment. Has the employee actually spotted an opportunity to commit fraud? Do they feel that because they're unmonitored at the moment, they are now empowered in this telework environment to commit a fraud? Do they suddenly have access to tools like dark web, the dark web? If we move to the next slide now, we're going to discuss the importance of the integrity triangle. So there are many ways to promote and enhance fraud awareness at your organization including developing a comprehensive fraud risk governance policy, developing enterprise-wide anti-fraud training programs, hosting fraud awareness events or activities periodically, and communicating roles and responsibilities related to that fraud risk management across all uh, levels of the organization. Promoting fraud awareness throughout your organization from the top down is vital to creating a strong anti-fraud culture. Indeed, enhancing fraud awareness and encouraging employees to actively discuss fraud risks openly and thoughtfully is essential. Serving as the counterbalance to the fraud triangle is what we call the, tri the integrity triangle. 
This emphasizes the values that encourage people to do what is right for the organization. The key elements in the integrity triangle are responsibility, accountability, and authority. When a person understands and appreciates that they have a responsibility to their organization, that they are accountable to its mission, and that they have the authority to effect a positive change in that organization, a culture intolerant of improper or inappropriate conduct, such as fraud, is more likely to persist. The foundation of this concept is awareness. Promoting awareness among your employees about both the threat of fraud and their capacity to combat it is essential for creating anti-fraud culture and can be a vital tool in fighting fraud in your organization. If we move on to the next slide, we'll look at a number of internal fraud examples. So the first one here is benefit schemes. And this is where an employee misrepresent, misrepresents information to achieve a higher payout um, of benefits, okay? So for example, many organizations are currently offering in the COVID environment um, additional benefits to their staff. These could be childcare or other costs that an employee might exploit for personal gains. You've also got benefit schemes, okay? Um, so, sorry, in addition to the, the items identified here, benefit schemes could be something like monitors, desks, and chairs. So what I mean by that is, um, at the beginning of COVID, you'll all remember the photos that we saw on, uh, Nash, on, on media sites. Those photos showed people standing outside their office blocks with chairs, with monitors, with, in some instances, they even had desks, okay? So they were bringing all of those home. Employers then started offering staff members the ability to purchase um, a monitor maybe for their home and um, basically get paid for that. So get reimbursed by their company for that monitor that was purchased. But they brought a monitor home from the office. So the individuals are going off, purchasing a monitor and selling that on and making a profit for themselves. Inside a threat, this is where an employee with access to sensitive information, such as uh, customer records, sells this information. Um, both Paul and Sinead have touched off this earlier, so I'm not going to spend much more time on this, albeit just to say, be mindful of the fact that because the controls have now been weakened because of COVID, those employees now have possibly better access to that sensitive information. Asset misappropriation and theft, we've touched off that. So a company uses a company asset, an employee even uses a company asset for personal purposes or reports an item stolen when in reality they've sold it for profit. And then corruption. Finally, an employee may bribe an official or collude with another party to defraud the organization to make up for lost personal income, okay? So these are just internal frauds that you need to be aware of. Next, we're going to do another poll question. Um, so if you could just take a moment to consider, what is your greatest COVID-19 fraud concern? Is it external threat? Is it insider threat? Or is it other? Okay. And if we just take a couple of seconds to think about that, and we're going to follow this up with another uh, question as well. So Jesse, if you could just share the results of that, that would be really helpful. So uh, that's very interesting. 58% believe external threats and 42% believe insiders. So we're nearly on par, that's really interesting. So the next poll question actually will we'll, we'll possibly drill into that a little bit more. So the next poll question, poll question five is what do you see as the key frauds in the current environment? Is it phishing, business email compromise, asset misappropriation, financial statement fraud, bribery or other? And we'll just take a couple of seconds. Okay, Jesse, if I could ask you to share those results, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so keeping in mind that 58% of uh, people said that they thought external frauds were, um, were those that they were more concerned about. So phishing of that, you've got 13 people or 45% said that they saw the key frauds, the key fraud in the current environment was phishing and business email compromise. That's very interesting. So we can see that 66% of participants believe that these external frauds are the key frauds in the current environment. 
And then you have the internal asset misappropriation and financial statement fraud coming next in line. That's really interesting and nothing on bribery. That's very interesting. I do believe based on the ACFE findings that the internal frauds are going to come to light at a, data sta a later stage. And I think that Sinead touched off this um, in her session. Now, next thing we're going to look at is the anti-fraud toolkit. So we've identified that there are risks and increased risks of fraud in this environment we find ourselves in. This, fraud, this um, toolkit as such is relevant for both internal and external um, frauds, okay? It consists of five steps. And the first step that you need to consider is identifying a champion. OK, so this is the first step. This person should have accountability for all pandemic related anti fraud programs. This person may already exist in your organization, but this is not a business as usual assignment. This person needs to be adaptable and inclined toward a rapid execution. This person must create an awareness around fraud and the possible schemes in these strange times that we find ourselves. As mentioned earlier, there are many ways to promote and enhance fraud awareness at your organization. This person should help in developing the comprehensive fraud risk governance policy. They should help in developing an enterprise wide anti fraud training program and hosting various fraud awareness events or activities. Okay. And um, we did also mention earlier that pro promoting fraud awareness um, throughout your organization from the top down is vital. Okay. So the champion must make sure to create this open environment as well that allows this awareness. Um, their points of focus should be on making an organizational commitment to fraud risk management, to supporting fraud risk governance, establishing a, co a comprehensive fraud risk management policy, establishing fraud risk governance roles and responsibilities throughout the organization. The next step looks at systems. As we mentioned earlier, IT are currently more than likely working with your employees to make sure that they can actually access their systems from remote locations. Therefore, the current systems may not be well suited to capturing these, these adequate this adequate data for new procedures. Okay. It's essential that we actually make sure that our systems are updated for people working from home, that new controls are possibly put in place to deal with this. Historically in Ireland, the reason that these controls may not have been in place historically is because historically in Ireland, we were a country where people worked from office blocks. There was minimal working from home. This, however, has changed significantly since COVID started, with well over 90% of regular office workers now working from home. That obviously excludes those who are essential workers. Okay, So uh, that's what we mean when we talk about systems. We need to update the systems. The next step is thinking like a fraudster. We need to ideate fraud schemes. So in these uncertain times, it's even more important to be proactive in identifying new threats. We need to establish a team to evaluate these emerging fraud schemes and gather intelligence from peers, regulators, and partners. We need to collaborate with cybersecurity teams to leverage existing threat intelligence sources. The next step is analytics. We need to leverage unsupervised detection techniques. So by these, I mean things like anomaly testing, network analysis, and expert rule systems. These are all forms of AI systems. Network anal analytics, for instance, in its simplest form, um, involves the analysis of a network of network data and statistics to identify trends and patterns. Network analytics is any process where network data is collected and analyzed to improve the performance, reliability, visibility, or security of a network. Anomaly detection. This is the identification of rare items, events, or observations, which raise suspicions by differing significantly from the majority of the data. And then expert rules. This is basically the simplest form of artificial intelligent, intelligence. It uses prescribed knowledge-based rules to solve a problem. The aim of the expert system is to take knowledge from a human expert and convert this into a number of hard-coded rules to apply to the input data. The last step is iterate. Fraud detection is not a set and forget process. Expect the threat landscape to evolve over time. You need to explore the use of robotic process automation, alert hibernation, and other methods to help deal with the increased volumes of alerts that fraud teams are likely to encounter. The next slide is a summary of each of these steps. Okay. Um, 
we have one final poll question, poll question six. Which step of the COVID-19 toolkit will your organization find most challenging to implement? Do you believe this is step one champion? Step two systems, so making sure that your systems are mindful of the fact that you do have people remote working now, and also making sure that some of those manual controls you may have historically had in place are actually altered, okay? Ideation, okay? Are you thinking like a fraudster? Analytics, have you put analytics in place to help identify and early detect frauds, internal and external, as they happen on your organization? And step five, iterate. This is not a step and forget process. You have to constantly keep on top of identifying new frauds that can and will arise over the next number of months and years through the fallout of COVID. So if we can have a quick look at the answers to that question, Jesse, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so systems and analytics. Those answers, to be honest, don't surprise me in the least. Um, actively taking the time to sit back and look at your systems and identify what controls were historically in place and what controls can now and have been overridden because of COVID. That does take time. Similarly, analytics, actually taking that step back and saying, okay, what analytics can I put in place to help me identify these frauds that could be committed or acted upon my organization? I think what's come to light from this, and especially given the fact that we identified that 71% um, of attendees on today's call have no plan in place for fraud. And um, I think this, if we move on to the next slide, this really does identify the fact that we do need to put fraud risk governance in place in organizations and that you need to think about putting a fraud risk governance plan in place with your organization. Also performing fraud risk assessment, a fraud risk assessment needs to be performed, fraud control activities, investigation and corrective actions and fraud risk management monitoring activities all need to be put in place in organizations. We are, have actually developed an anti-fraud playbook, which, will, which we will be doing sessions on in quarter one of next year. So maybe people on this call may like to attend that call, or if you have any questions on it, please feel free to contact us. Now, if we could, if anyone has questions, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A section and I will monitor those um, and, and field them out to the appropriate people. Now, I've just got one come in here and Sinead, maybe you'd be able to answer this. This mm -hmm. question goes along the lines of what do you think is the biggest fraud risk to businesses in the current environment? So maybe Sinead, you'd like to answer that and maybe Paul, you might like to follow up on something on that. Yeah, that's great. Um, I has to say that unfortunately there's quite a lot of risks out there, but for us and for me personally, I think the biggest risk risk is is cyber. Um, it's the cyber risks that are currently out there. They come in many shapes or forms, and they're from outside of your organisation, um, and it's something that you can't necessarily control. So to me, that over the last kind of number of months during the pandemic, it's that for me is the biggest risk to to local um, and national businesses so it's important that you have your first line of defense being your employees um, up to speed with new challenges and new ways of working and ensure that they that they have the proper skills and, and, and expertise to challenge external threats that come that come through cyber whether that be through um, kind of phishing or ransomware or malware um, but employees are your first line of defense so it's important that they, that they are upskilled to deal with them but yeah for me for me it would be cyber would be one of the the biggest risks during this pandemic. Great and Paul what are your thoughts? Yes yeah, so I would agree with the cyber and indeed you know nearly all frauds are perpetrated these days through computers and, and digital means. Standing back from it though I would I would also say that you know, organizations are stretched at the moment um, and it's more difficult really to look at the red flags that, that we would be so accustomed, so accustomed to, 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 to identifying um, you know, oddities and behavior, strange things, um, you know, changes in procedures, um, you know, sometimes quite hard to define, but employees will, will, will often actually identify something wrong and raise it through, let's say, an internal hotline, for example. I think we could be missing that, um, missing that chance. Um, and, and I suppose the other thing that I would say is, look, we've got a year end coming up, you know, for, for, for many companies. 
Um, so I do think that there is a financial statement risk and then following on from that, a, a, a tax risk. Um, so that, that would be my summary points. Okay, great. Um, we actually were very quiet on the question front today. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Have you got anything through there, Sinead, either? Um, not at the minute. Um, no, I think we're good. I think just in the interest of time as well. Look, we'll make our um, our contact details available on the next slide as well. Um, and, you know, you, you'll be able to contact us through various means, through LinkedIn, through email. So if there's anything specific, because I am conscious that the nature of what we're talking about is can be quite sensitive sensitive and not everybody wants to disclose a specific example um, of, a, of a fraud that they may or may not have have experienced so we're here anytime to have a chat um, through that and we can we can certainly share our expertise in, in a more individual in an individual forum and that's no problem at all just another uh, just, uh, question just two question, yeah um, one question has just been raised um, how about internal audits and, and how does that play play a part in in, in all of this yeah, I think that's actually key, Martin. Um, internal audit will definitely have a, a significant part to play in this, whether it be working, for instance, with the champion, because internal audit are going to be quite busy working with the champion or indeed taking on that champion role and actually identifying what all these frauds are and then actually following up and, and being mindful of um, the potential for frauds and the different overriding of controls, etc. I think that's definitely something if I was in internal audit, it's an area I'd be concentrating on overriding of controls and looking at internal threats definitely is an area that I'd be I'd be focusing on significantly. Sinead, Paul, do you have anything else to add to that? I think just quickly, it's important that internal audit is properly resourced. Um, so I think that's a, that's a key thing. Um, and I think I think the other thing which can often be quite helpful is internal audit to be involved in that phase of thinking like a fraudster and sometimes having those those sessions with with um, all staff um, throughout the organisation of of how would I extract some money out or how would I you know conduct a, a fraud against the organisation whether internally or externally they can be really useful sessions that I've seen internal audits play play a very good part in that in that. Um, Position. Paul, you've hit it on the head there. All members of staff should be involved in identifying the fraud because it's oftentimes those doing the day job as such that actually know how they can override controls. So it is really essential to get everyone involved in that. Um, a, a final question. Is there a core assessment questionnaire which organisations can go through to help them with their fraud risk assessment. There actually, there is, um, and I'm happy to discuss that with you in further detail, or if you want to contact one of us on the uh, contact list here, we can discuss that with you in more, more detail um, and walk you through that. That forms part of our playbook at the moment, but yes, we would absolutely be delighted to, to show you uh, what that is, okay? Okay. I know and I am aware that we've gone slightly over time. So hopefully everyone found this um, a, a beneficial um, webinar. If you do have any questions or want to follow up on anything, please do feel free to reach out to any of us. You've got all the contact details here. So you've got Paul, Sinead, myself, and then you've got our colleagues, Paddy, or Patrick, Andrew, and Mike. So feel free to reach out to any of us. Okay. So on behalf of Grant Thornton, we'd all very much, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you again uh, and have, have, a, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks all.